Hello and welcome to our second video on statistics. I'm Mr. Chowdhury and today we're going to be looking at collecting data but now sampling. So the idea is in the last video we looked at how to make a good questionnaires and how to collect a bit of data but then how do you decide who to give your data to? How do you decide who you want to be part of your experiment or your analysis? So what you need to do is you need to do some something called sampling and that's what we're going to be looking at um, today. So before we do anything, we're going to come up with some key definitions of words that you need to understand before we can move forward. Those key words are population, and the population is the entire group of people, animals, things that we want to find information about. So, for example, we can say the population of a jungle would be all the animals in the jungle. You could talk about the plant population. You could talk about uh, cars in a car park. The population would be all of the cars in the car park. So it doesn't have to be living things. It can be anything we want to analyze or find information about. That is called the population when we include everything right then a sample a sample is a part of the population which we use to collect uh, information about and usually we use what we learn from the sample to try and apply it to the rest of the population uh, and we'll talk about why we might want to take a sample uh, throughout this lesson and the last one is a census and the census is when we use every member of a population to help us uh, collect our information that's what a census is every member of the population to collect our information if we get information from everyone in that population then we are taking a census so we have population sample census i would suggest you uh, screen grab this slide or you just write these uh, definitions down because they are going to be used throughout this lesson so i'll give you some time now pause the video screen grab it or write it down Okay, so now let's continue with the actual uh, lesson. So here I have a bag of shapes. You have to imagine all of these shapes are inside a bag. Uh, I've drawn a diagram of all my shapes. I've put the shapes next to each other to make it easier. So all the shapes are next to each other, all the squares are next to each other. Um, that's what I've done here. And what I'd like you to do is pause the video and tell me what's the population of this bag? What is the population of my bag? Okay, the population of my bag is 36. Like we said just prior, population is everything that we are looking at. So the population is every single shape here, and there are 36 shapes to choose from, so the population of the bag is 36. So if I was to pick some shapes uh, out of the bag, if I was to pick some of the shapes, I would be taking a, pause the video, what do you think? I would be taking a sample, I would be taking a sample of the shapes out of my bag. So here is what we're going to be looking at. So some of my shapes, they have a hole in them. Uh, they have a hole in them. Some of my shapes, they just got a hole in them. Uh, we'll imagine some slugs have eaten away at some of my shapes. Um, what I want to know is I want to know which ones have, have holes in them. Which one of my shapes have holes in them? Now, if I was to check every single individual shape, I would be taking a pause the video. What do you think? I would be taking a census. Okay, I would be taking a census. And the advantages of taking a census is I would know the exact number of shapes with holes in them. That's what I would know. If I took a census, I would know exactly how many shapes had holes in them. There would be no doubt because I would have counted and looked at every single shape and went, yep, yeah, this many shapes have holes in them, this many shapes don't. The disadvantage is that it would be very time consuming. There are 36 shapes here, and you might be thinking it won't be take that long to take to look through 36 shapes. But what if there were 36,000 shapes? What if there were 36 million shapes? Taking a census would be extremely difficult in those situations. So in that case, that's where we would take a sample. And we're gonna look at different types of sampling. So let's have a look at these different types of sampling. So what types of samples could I do? So I could do a random sample. I could do a systematic sample and I could do a stratified sample. Now we're going to go through each one of these, what they are and how we do them with regards to our um, shapes that we have here. And it's going to be, we're going to take some random samples of these shapes. We're going to take a systematic sample of these shapes and we're going to take a stratified sample of the shapes. So we'll start off with how many things I want to be in my sample. So I want my sample to be a quarter of all of the shapes. So how many shapes would I need to be in my sample? How many shapes would I need to have in my sample? Well, I've got 36 shapes, and I want a quarter of my shapes in my sample. So that means I would need nine shapes in my sample. And we're going to begin, like I said earlier, with random sampling. So what is a random sample? Well, 
a random sample would be that I would pick nine shapes at random from my population. Uh, and I would make sure that it was random by using a random number generator on a computer, on a calculator, or an app on a phone. Or I could just put them in a bag, shake the bag up, and then just take out nine shapes very quickly to make sure that it was random. Because if I try to pick randomly, I might have some underlying bias uh, in my shapes. And it's really important that we are as unbiased in our selection of our samples as possible. So let's take a random sample of this. So once again, here's the definition. Let's take a random sample of our 36 shapes. So all I'm doing is I use a random number generator to just pick a bunch of shapes. There we go. I've got my nine shapes. So then what are the advantages of a random sample? Well, the advantages are they are quick and easy and it does avoid bias if we are truly random. If we're truly random, it will avoid all bias. However, there are some disadvantages and here's the first disadvantage. If you look at the shapes I've picked What's the one thing that I've forgotten to do? One thing that's just happened in my random sample? Well, I haven't picked any pentagons. And that's one of the main disadvantages of random sampling. There is a possibility that my sample will be unrepresentative of the entire population, which is really important that we make sure that we are representative as possible because it might be that all of my shapes don't have any holes in them and all of the holes are inside the pentagons but I'll never know that because I didn't pick any pentagons so it's really important that we try and make sure that our sample is representative of the population right so our next type of sampling our next type of sampling is taking a systematic sample taking a systematic sample well what is a systematic sample well we assign each shape a number and then I pick every X shapes. So I still want my sample to be nine. So because I want nine shapes, I pick every fourth shape. Because if I've got 36 shapes total and I'm picking every fourth one, if I did that, I'd end up with nine shapes at the end. So I've numbered all my shapes. So there they are. They've been numbered one to 36. And I'm going to pick every fourth one. So I go one, two, three, four, pick a shape. One, two, three, four, pick a shape. One, two, three, four, pick a shape. And so on until I've gone through all of my shapes there we go now what are the advantages of doing a systematic sample what are the advantages of doing a systematic sample well once again it avoids bias and it's very easy to execute i can very quickly go one two three four pick a shape one two three four pick a shape i can do that very easily especially if i've numbered them i know that i'm only going to pick numbers in the four times table so i just go through my list of shapes if i had a thousand shapes i just pick every fourth one and it'd be very easy to do now here are the disadvantages it is very time consuming when I have a lot of data to manually go in and pick every fourth shape. Uh, it assumes that we know what the population size is. It assumes that we know what the population size is. And the last thing is there is a massive risk, a really big risk of manipulating the data to present what we want it to present. So, for example, if I put the shapes in a different order, I could ensure that I picked a circle every fourth shape if that's what I wanted to do. If I wanted to prove that red cars were the favorite car in my area, if I lined up all the cars so that every fourth car was red, I could say, well, look, everyone in my area, everyone in my sample has a red shape, uh, red car, in which case you'd have to take my uh, evidence for it. So the problem with systematic sampling is it's really easy to manipulate the samples that we end up with. Right, so we've looked at random sampling, we've looked at systematic sampling, and the last one we have to look at is stratified sampling. So what is a stratified sample? Well, a stratified sample is where we find the sample size as a fraction of the population, and then we find that fraction of each subgroup, right? So we'll carry on with our example, with our shapes. So the sample size we want is nine, and the population we want, or we have, is 36. So we do 9 over 36, which we can simplify to a quarter. And what we're going to do is we're going to find a quarter of each subgroup. Now, luckily, our shapes are split up into subgroups, which are circles, squares, triangles, and pentagons. So I would find a quarter of each subgroup. So I know there are 16 circles, so I find a quarter of 16. There are four squares, so I find a quarter of those squares. And this is what it would look like if I found a quarter of each subgroup. So I would need to sample four circles, one square, two triangles, and two pentagons. That's what I would need to do. So now I'm just going to take a random sample. I'm going to do a random. I'm going to randomly pick four circles, randomly pick one square, randomly pick one triangle, and randomly pick one pentagon. 
So there we got four circles, one square, two triangles and two pentagons. Now, what are the positives and the negatives of having a stratified sample? What are the advantages and disadvantages? Well, the advantages of having a stratified sample is that it avoids bias, it's really easy to execute and it is proportionally representative. We can see that each of these shapes is proportionally the same as the population. Our sample has the same proportions of circles as our uh, same proportion of circles in regards to our sample as the circles are with regards to our population. The disadvantages are that it is very time consuming if I have big data and it can't be used with all studies. So if there were overlapping subgroups, it becomes very different, uh, difficult as well. If there are multiple subgroups, if there are loads of subgroups, sometimes there might be a subgroup where there's only one thing inside it. Like it becomes very difficult when there are a lot of subgroups or overlapping subgroups. An easy example would be if you think about chocolates, there may be chocolates that are that are milk chocolate but also have caramel inside. So do you put them in the milk chocolate category or do you put them in the caramel category or do you make a separate category called milk chocolate and caramel that's where stratified sampling becomes a bit more difficult because of the subgroups okay so the key things to take away from this uh, sampling uh, video the key thing that you should have taken away are as follows uh, sampling allows us to quickly collect data uh, to get information about a larger population we use sampling all of the time uh, when we're doing things at school they will sample certain students uh, when they're figuring out things in from uh, in product design, they sample people, they'll have focus groups that will test out products and use that to help them generalize for the general public. We use sampling all the time across the real world a lot. Each sampling method has advantages and disadvantages and it's important that we know what the advantages and disadvantages are so that we can pick the appropriate sampling method for what we're trying to do in our experiments, products, analysis, whatever we're trying to do. We need to make sure we know what the advantages and disadvantages are for each of the sampling groups. And the last thing that I didn't quite talk about in the previous video but is really important to understand is that sampling methods are more reliable when they are combined. So for example, in stratified sampling that I just did, we did a random stratified sample. And that would be significantly more effective than just, a, than just a random sample on its own. So if we can combine different sampling methods together, we can create a much more uh, accurate and reliable picture of the whole population. So now you need to decide if you're feeling super happy and you're super confident with what we've just done and gone through. What I suggest you do is you go and watch Mr. Amerson's video to do a bit of practice. Or if you're feeling super confident, you go on Dr. Frost and Corbett Maths to do some practice of your own. Go off, be productive, and I'll see you in the next video.